was weird. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you about something that is kind of a passion of mine. Um, I was approached several weeks ago to ask if I would be willing to talk to you guys about parenting. And this is kind of a hobby of mine. This is, of all the things that I had to learn about, like, in school, this is the thing that I really grabbed a hold of, and I really kind of like the subject a lot. So I love this subject. I read about it. I teach a class about it, and it's my job to help families make changes in their parenting so that their, their families can function a little bit better. Um, today, I'll be talking mainly to the parents, but it's okay if you're here today and you're not a parent because you have a parent, and you function in a family, and the things that we're talking about um, can transfer to other parts of your role in a family. So, um, so it, it's applicable to you too. Um, when you're studying to be a therapist, you learn a lot about what we call family systems, okay? And that is when we're studying how family members interact with each other and how individuals in a family interact with each individual, okay? Um, before preparing for today, I already kind of knew some things about family systems. That's what I study, and that's usually... Um, the parts that I'm, I'm picking apart when I'm trying to help people. Um, but when I was given this task, I needed to gain more wisdom in, prepare, in preparing for sharing this information with you. So I went to the first place that I could think of, the place where all parenting experts go to share their knowledge, TikTok. <laughs> I shared, I'm going to share with you guys because you got more teenagers in here. I did not have a TikTok until yesterday, okay? I watched TikTok videos from Facebook. Um, and so I knew what I was getting myself into, but not quite. And just let me tell you, <laughs> it's a lot different of a world like uh, than I've ever experienced before. So basically, TikTok is a great platform for anybody who wants to share tips about parenting, discipling, and even mental health without having the burden of facts or formal training. <laughs> you can just say whatever you want to say. And you can put a pretty filter on it, and you can be pretty, and then people listen to you. <laughs> and that's, what, that's how it works. Um, it's also where millions of parents are getting their ideas for how to mold the next generation. So I spent some time looking up TikTok things for parenting, okay, search for parenting. This is what I've gathered as I've delved into the pit of this part of the internet, okay. These are real, these are, and they're serious. <laughs> okay, if you are a small child and your mom puts you in time out, you can say, I don't have to be here, <laughs> and get up and leave. Mom will be happy because you have the spirit of a warrior. <laughs> We're going to talk about that, that warrior in a minute. If you raise your voice to your child, it is proper for him to say, you don't get to talk to me like that. <laughs> because your, your mom's going to be happy you stood up for yourself. Okay. Um, if you punish a child for throwing a tantrum, you are degrading your child because they are struggling with something. <laughs> Um, if you ask your child to do something, they are allowed to politely decline because as an adult, you don't have to do stuff if you don't feel like it, so why should they have to do stuff if they don't feel like it? And lastly, it is disrespectful to your child to tell them you should have brought a jacket when they complain about being cold after you told them to bring a jacket. You should have just brought the jacket, and when they were cold, give it to them. <laughs> this is what I have learned from the Internet. <laughs> It is a, it's a rough place to learn about parenting. So after spending some time listening to these experts, this is the conclusion that I've come to. The state of family is in crisis. Everything is backwards. Everything is upside down. God has ordained the family to function in a certain way. Then we took the concept that he created and we slowly began changing things into what we wanted. Over time, we traded the functional elements from his original design in favor of dysfunction. We didn't mean to do this. It was gradual. It probably took several decades of tweaking things and making things be different. But over time, we took the roles given to us as parents and slowly traded them for dysfunction. The family was a well-thought-out game plan. Um, we decided we could improve on it. Little by little, we chipped away at the foundation of what a family is supposed to be, and then we acted surprised when the house started caving in. That's why I love this series, because it really helps us examine our individual roles in the family to help us reflect on what God wanted us to be instead of what we wanted us to be. So how do you become a godly parent? To find out, I turned to the actual parenting expert, which is God's Word. As I was looking for verses on parenting, I was a little surprised because they weren't as specific as I was really actually thinking that they would be. Um, I was expecting, like, specifically, you need your, to teach your sons this, and as a mom, you need to teach this, and all these things. Um, but instead, what I found was kind of a more um, vague but 
directive um, directions from what God wants us to do. Um, what I find found boils down to this one verse, Proverbs 22, 6, which is train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. That's one that we've all heard, but it's so true, and it's really the basis of everything that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so, I mean, moms have specific roles, just like in Titus 2, 4 through 5, it says, they can, they, then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so no one will malign the word of God. And dads also have specific roles, such as Ephesians 6, 4 says, fathers do not exasperate your children, instead bring them up in the training and the instructions of the Lord. We like the verse before that that usually says, like, kids listen to your parents but this one is also dads don't do things to anger your children um and, and so we all kind of work together in this way besides these verses the only verses that i could find really have to do with making sure to discipline your children that's a biggie that's the vast majority of parenting things is you should discipline them um, promoting joy in your family helping them to remember the things that god has done for you and that's kind of it that's kind of the specific things um the job the Bible is assigning to parents, besides the specific ones right there, is this. To be a godly parent is to be a godly person in front of your kids, thereby teaching them to be godly adults. We do this by loving each other, by being kind to each other, by showing patience to each other, by being silly and goofy and fun and not just serious all the time, but also by providing structure and security. That's the plan. It's a great plan. However, we cannot do that plan if we trade in what God has asked us to do for what the world is demanding that we do in our role as parents. So how did we get from a godly family to a worldly family? I'm going to tell you four trade-offs that we have made as a society, and at the end I'm going to tell you how we can trade those back. All right, number one, we traded our God-ordained roles for socially approved roles. Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. One of the biggest trends that I see in families, just kind of overall working with not just school kids, but, um, but anybody in, in society, um, there's a big movement away from parents being the authority of the house. One of the videos that I witnessed was um, a woman explaining why she doesn't require her kids to obey her. Um, it was actually the second video in a series. The first one was saying, I don't make them obey me. If they say they don't want to do something, I'm like, okay. When are you going to do it? <laughs> and they'll be like, I have decided I will probably do it sometime else. And that was her video, okay? And then somebody watched it, and they got upset a little bit about it and said, if you, if you teach your kids these things, then they're just going to think that you're, they're your equals. So her response video was, of course I do. I, I want my kids to think that because they are my equals. Unfortunately, as nice as that sounds, this is a concept that goes against what the Bible ordains as the authority of the parents. Here's the thing. Your children are equal to you in some ways. For instance, they have equal value as you. They are equally important people to you. They are equally made in God's image. However, they're not equal to you in several ways. For instance, they're not equal to you in maturity. They're not equal to you in intelligence or wisdom or your experience. God knew this when he assigned the roles. He knew not to give authority to the people that don't know which foot to put the shoe on. <laughs> That's you. No matter how smart or precocious your child is, their brain is just not developed in the areas of logic, reasoning, cause and effect, and they cannot objectively make decisions without emotions being involved. That doesn't come around until like 21. I didn't even tell the first crowd that, but that's true. Like that, even as teenagers, you guys are getting smarter, you're getting wiser, but you just aren't there yet, and that's okay. Um, the trend in America right now is this false belief that kids know what they're doing in all areas, and we have to trust them and listen to them and do what they say. Yes, you should be listening to your kids. You should hear them out. Their, their emotions are valid. Their opinions are valid. Yes, you should be letting them practice decision-making in their own life because that is very important and essential to gaining independence one day. But don't put them in charge of major decisions like whether or not they are allowed to go to church or whether or not they're allowed to obey rules because those have spiritual implications. We have to be diligent about teaching our kids the importance of authority. If we fail to do that, we're setting them up for failure because there's no time in your kid's life where they're not going to be underneath the authority of somebody. Right now they're in school, okay? They have a teacher, they have a principal, and that's my job in schools is to help kids work with the teachers and the principals because if they're assigned to me a lot of the times it means 
that they're getting in trouble or they're not listening or they're not doing what they're supposed to. And sometimes if I'm talking to kids about this and I'm like, what is this about? What's going on? In general, their answers will be something like, my, my teachers don't know anything. <laughs> they, don't, they don't get to tell me anything because they're just glorified babysitters. They don't care about me. They're just here for a check. And as somebody that works with like 100 teachers, I can tell you that is pretty much, I don't think ever has that been a problem. So where are they getting this from? Why do they think the teachers don't care about them? It's because their parents are saying that at home. They say that about the parents that they had, um, or the teachers that they had, and they're saying it about the teachers that are getting on to their kids for doing stuff they're not supposed to be doing. Um, Respect for authority starts at the home. What about if they want a job when they get up? Maybe they're just going to like make it through school and they're just going to go out in the workforce. They're going to have a boss, okay? Try telling your boss, no, thank you. I do not feel like doing this task today. <laughs> and see how long you have a boss. <laughs> authority is everywhere. And knowing your place is not a degrading thing. We talk about knowing your place. Ooh, don't tell me to know my place. But it's a good thing, it's, and it's essential to being a functioning adult in society. So I'm going to leave this point alone with this little secret that kids don't want you to know, especially probably teenagers. <laughs> kids like to have an authority figure. <laughs> They might pretend like they don't like to have an authority figure, but they do. Kids who have stable authority figures in their lives don't suffer as much from depression and anxiety because they know that they're secure. They know that they can count on you. They don't want you to know that because then they won't be able to do whatever they want to do. <laughs> but they do. They want to have that security. Ty was talking to me the other day about when he was playing with the boys. He and the boys like to wrestle a lot because they just be like that. And they're, they were very excited laughing, having the best time in the world. And he comes to me after and he's like, did you notice like while we were wrestling, he was winning because dads, you should be winning, okay? The point was to push him off the bed or to like hold him down and not let him push you off. And he was winning as he should. And he pointed out, did you notice when they're upset with each other or whenever they wrestle with each other and they lose, then they get upset. But when they wrestle with dad and he wins, nobody gets upset. And the point that he was making is, Deep down, kids need to know that their dad is the strongest one in the room, okay? My six-year-old knows that if, if he's the strongest one in the room, he's, in, he's doomed, okay? <laughs> he is not going to survive because he's little, he's scrappy, but it's not going to go well. Um, he needs to have that security in his dad because his dad is the authority in our house. So take pride in your role as your child's authority and the protector so that they can feel secure and that their well-being is your job and not their own. All right, the second way that we start moving away from God's plan for families is we trade accountability for tranquility. So kids do weird things. Sometimes they do things that are not, um, that are against the rules or sometimes that are just flat out wrong. My kids are no exception. Um, some of you know Henry. He's a little firecracker. He just turned five. Um, he's the baby of the family, and that sometimes means that they're more emotional. In this case, it's, it's true. Um, and probably out of all the kids, he's the one that has had, we've had the most trouble with getting the behavior where it's going. Is that fair? Okay. Um, I mean, all of them have had little things here and there, um, but he's kind of been going through a really hard year the last year. Um, he's been in a habit of being very disrespectful, like slamming doors, giving me his mean eyebrows and crossing them little arms and things like that telling me he doesn't have to do what I want him to do or he doesn't want to do what I want him to do. Um, and even one time he told Miss Kelly a couple years ago in the nursery that she can't tell him how to live his life. <laughs> I blame all the sass on Ty. It's definitely from his side. <laughs> just, kidding. just kidding. Just kidding. But how we responded to those things is crucial. Um, we know we have the authority in his life, so we realize we have to hold him accountable. And that's the aspect that we're missing a lot in parenting. Every time he slammed a door, there was a punishment. Sometimes that punishment was time out. Sometimes it was that he had to walk through that door calmly 20 times. But sometimes, I'll be honest with you, it was spanking. And that's something that I'm going to not spend very long on, but I do have to mention it if I'm asked to talk about parenting. Um, people believe that spanking's not a really great thing these days. It's not very popular. They believe it's crossing a line. There's a lot of opinions about this, and I'm not going to express opinions about this because I'm not here to tell you about my opinions. I'm here to tell you about what the Bible says about these things. Um, take my parenting class if you want to know more things about that. Um, but the Bible is very clear on its stance of corporal punishment. Proverbs 23, 13. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish them with a rod, they will not die. <laughs> but did you die? <laughs> that's, what, that's what the Bible's saying, but did you die? 
Strike him with a rod and you will deliver his soul from Sheol or from, from, from hell, from eternal damnation. Do you, would you rather them have a little bit of pain right now or would you rather them have an eternity of pain? That's the question. I'm not saying to snatch your kids up. I'm not saying to cross the line. I'm not even saying this spanking should be your go-to move every time. Um, I don't believe you should ever spank unless you are calm and you can explain to your child what it is that you're doing. But we are so afraid to let our kids experience anything negative, including pain. I'm here to tell you that that one swat on the butt when you're calm and in control sends a very straightforward message that what you just did will not be tolerated. And kids understand that very straightforward message. It's not abuse and it's not a sin, but what is a sin is going against what God has ordered you to do to train up in your child in the way that they should go. I guarantee that calmly explaining to a child that hitting their brother with a frying pan is not going to train anybody. <laughs> they are not going to hear that message. They're going to ignore it, and their problem is going to get worse. And guess what? Henry is getting better. I just want to throw that out there. Why? Because he knows every time he hurts his brother, because he loves to throw them, them hands, <laughs> every time he hurts his brother, he knows he's going to be in trouble. He knows he's going to have real, immediate, consistent consequences, and that's what we've done with all of our boys. And I was worried about the middle one when he went to, to kindergarten, but we worked so hard with him when he was little that we didn't, we've never had a behavior problem at school, ever, not even once. And, I mean, is it because that we're great parents? No, it's because we've done what God told us to do. So um, accountability is essential. We have to teach kids at an early age that their actions impact others. I worry about the kids of these TikTokers that I talked about. We kind of laugh about it, but I do worry about them. I worry about that little boy whose mom is glad that he has the spirit of a warrior. Because when he's three, that's one thing. But then when he grows up and is in a relationship, what happens when that lady doesn't do something that he wants her to do? Is there going to be a war? Is that what's going to happen? Because he's been taught that if he breaks rules or does something disrespectful or hurts somebody, literally nothing will happen to him. His mom has told him that he doesn't have to be held account accountable. He can do whatever he wants. Um... Alternative schools are filled with kids who have never been held accountable. Am I right, Miss Jenny? Okay. Um, those kids have mom and dads who make excuses for them and bail them out of their consequences of their poor decisions until they can't do it anymore because it's over, over their heads. They will grow up to be adults who make the same mistakes. Kids cannot understand right now how their now affects their future. That's why it's our job to take the future and bring it to them. They don't understand that calling all of your friends names every day will one, one day mean that you don't have any friends. So since you called him a jerk today, we're going to move that bad consequences all the way up till today so you can feel those effects now. Then you can decide if that's going to affect your behavior tomorrow. All right, number three, we traded our boundaries for chaos. God is a God of boundaries. The Bible is filled with examples of God laying down commandments and laws and people breaking them. Think of Israel. God commanded them time and time again to turn away from their, God, their other gods and worship him, and every time they didn't, there were major consequences. Or think about the Garden of Eden. God said if they ate of the fruit, they would be sent out. When they ate of the fruit, he sent them out because he did what he said he's going to do. That's because God is perfectly just, and they were guilty of a sin. But now God also has perfect grace and was able to walk them through the punishment of being kicked out. But that did not negate the importance of him actually dealing out the punishment to begin with. Biblical boundaries are very important, but we have a problem in modern parenting in that there are no boundaries between moms and kids and moms and, and dads. Though There's no boundaries between them. Um, kids are not good at boundaries, and they're not supposed to be because they're kids. But it's our job to meet them where they are and help them to get better. Um, but are you good at boundaries as a parent? Here's some things to think about. What are some things that you are allowing into your child's life? We talked about social media earlier, and I don't mean to blame TikTok for all the world's problems, because um, really social media isn't actually the problem, it's the symptom. Social media is a mirror for how the world has turned away from God. And as you've seen, the messages on these platforms are overwhelmingly anti-Christian. If your child is spending hours a day ingesting these things, you're allowing their minds to be altered bit by bit to something that is completely different from what it is supposed to be. What about movies? Are you letting your, your small children watch movies that are like really bad, like people being brutally murdered? I can't tell you how many times in this city I've seen like kids that are really obsessed with like very violent things or very inappropriate material, things like that. Did you know that their brains are not even able to handle that imagery? 
It's evil. Their brains are not set up to process that. I've never met a child who's obsessed with those kinds of things, who didn't have either anger issues, violence issues, or severe anxiety, including really bad nightmares. Having this type of input can only create dysfunctional output. What about this? Do they know your business? Do they know everything going on in your family? Do they know why you're upset with your mom or your dad or why you're upset with their dad or their mom? Um, I've spoken to several kids who, who are very aware of exactly why their mom and dad got a divorce. Like dad did something secretly or mom did something secretly and somehow it got back to them. How do they know those things? It's because an adult sat down and talked to them about things that they shouldn't know about. The rule should be never share things with a child that are that are adult issues and don't share things with kids that are out of control. It's part of our job as protectors. What about emotional boundaries? Do you get upset with your kids for things that aren't even their fault? Like maybe you're upset at work, you come home, now you're upset with them because <laughs> they're there. You might even be uh, finding a way to blame them for a reason you're upset. Well, I wouldn't be so frustrated today if you would put up all of your stuff. Your child is not in charge of your emotions. That's on you. Do you say bad things about your kids to them or to other people? That's a boundary problem. Ephesians 4.29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. This, this doesn't just apply to our lives as, as Christians, it does, but it also applies to you and your children. Um, is what you're saying to them or about them helpful? Does it build them up? Does it fix whatever problem that you are upset about? When someone walks away from a conversation with you, are they thinking, man, that person really loves their kid? Or are they thinking, man, they must really hate being a parent? Our job is to nurture and teach, both of which can be harmed by what we say about our kids. These are just a few examples, the ones that I could think of. Your child is not your best friend. They're not your scapegoat. They're your they are your child, and it is your job not to shield them from everything that could happen, but to keep the effects of the world away from them until they're grown enough to do that for themselves. All right, and lastly, we trade what is right for their momentary happiness. The world is obsessed with being happy. It's the number one thing that the world wants right now. Um, I want my kids to be happy, and I want your kids to be happy, but happiness is not the most important thing. Happiness is not import more important than what is right, and it's not more important than what is true. In fact, the Bible does not say, get yourself happy, pursue happiness, find happiness. In fact, it says to do the right thing even if it makes us sad. Second Corinthians 4.17 says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving us for an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So right now, it's hard and it's gonna be a struggle, but the payoff is greater. We don't want to discipline our kids because it's going to make our kids sad. And then if they're sad, it's going to make us sad. Or worse, it's going to make them angry with us, and then we're going to be angry at them. Sometimes we just want the kid, we just want to do whatever makes the kid happy. However, when you don't teach them what is right, you'll be sacrificing their happiness right now and robbing them of their eternal glory that outweighs all of their small troubles. Here's an example. I've had several parents over the years um, come to me with problems such as, like, I can't get my kid off their phone. <laughs> or I can't get my kid off their video games. Like, that's just one example. Um, that's easy, you just take the phone away. <laughs> like, I fixed it. <laughs> um, but, then, but then I get argue, I get yeah buts. Um, yeah, but we can't do that because we tried that one time and they fussed and they called us bad parents and they got really mad at us and slammed doors. I'm like, okay, well, what did you do then? We gave back their phone. <laughs> okay, well then their plan worked. Their malicious plan worked. They did exactly what they wanted you to do. You know what to do with your kids. You know how to lay down boundaries. You just don't want to do it because it's really hard. You would rather them be happy in the moment and suffer the consequences later. But the thing is, we can't afford to do that as parents because the consequence of habitually placing happiness over righteousness is eternal. So, here's my conclusion. We've given away too much power as parents. We've traded God concepts for world concepts. All of these trades have underlying spiritual problems, but the, the good news is that they all have spiritual solutions. So if you're abandoning your God-ordained role as a parent, what you're saying is, I know God wants it this way, but I think my way is better. The solution, we have to humble ourselves. Ask for forgiveness. Ask God to show you what your role is in the family. Take back that role as mom or dad. It's yours for a reason. Trust in an all-knowing God that he can help you fulfill your role as a parent, with his help, of course. 
Next one, when we abandon accountability, what we're saying is, I know that God wants me to train up my child in the right way, but that's hard, and I don't believe my child will be okay if I'm too hard on them. God specifically calls you to hold your children accountable. The solution to that, lay down the rules for your house. Let your kids know what the consequence will be for breaking those rules. Stick to the rules. Ask God to help you have boldness with your child as they learn how to function in their family. And ask him for the energy to do this because you're going to need it to start holding people accountable. Um, When we abandon boundaries, what we're saying is, I don't want to be told by anybody what to do with my child or what to say with my child. The solution is, ask God to show you where you might be crossing the line. Ask him to examine your heart. Are there things that you need to change in regards to what you allow in your child's life? Be teachable by God. And lastly, when we place our child's happiness, happiness over doing the right thing, we are saying my feelings are more important than God's truth. Ask God to help you trust in his plan and in, in his process. Make it a habit to ask yourself, is this thing I'm doing right instead of is this thing I'm doing going to make everybody happy? As the musicians make their way back, I want to add one last point. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the concept of the ship of Theseus. I hadn't either until very recently. But this is how this thought experiment goes. A man named Theseus owns a ship. It's docked in a harbor, and it's made entirely out of wood. Over time, the wood planks are replaced by other wood wood planks, and pretty soon, there's not one piece of the original ship left. The question that would be asked by your philosophy professor, which is where they would be saying these things, is, is this still the ship of Theseus? If it's still the same ship, if it's not still the same ship, at what point did it stop being the same ship? God built a beautiful thing when he built the family. He created the concept of fatherhood. Fathers are supposed to protect, discipline, and be strong spiritual leaders. But society has decided all of those things are toxic, so we trade out godly dads for worldly dads. God created the mother. The mother is supposed to love and be nurturing to her family, as well as model a godly life. Society has decided that's not strong enough, so we we switch out the godly moms for worldly moms. God decided to have a mom and dad both be in charge of the kids, but society decided, first of all, women don't even need men. Marriage is not important, and kids can govern themselves. So we trade out the godly relationships for the worldly relationships. God designed kids to be obedient and respectful, and to honor their parents, but society calls that a dictatorship, and it actively supports a rebellious spirit. We trade out our godly children for worldly children. At what point have we stopped being the unit that God created us to be? Take a look at your own family. What concessions have you personally made so that you can be in line with the world instead of being in line with Christ as a parent or as a child? I don't know the answer to that, but he does. The altar call is simple today. There are parts of your family that are dysfunctional. If there are parts of your family that are made out of people, then there's some dysfunction there. That's human nature. There may be anger, abuse, rebellion, disharmony, hatefulness. There may be a lot of things. Some things you need to ask forgiveness for today. Some things you need to forgive others for. Some things you may not have even been a part of, but your heart is heavy for your family because you see the things that they're getting away from God and you're seeing how things are starting to fall apart. But today is the day that we start turning things over to God and start the process of trading back all that the enemy has stolen. If any of these things resonate with you today, we would love to pray for you.